Good morning and welcome, wherever you may be. I, I pray that you are safe and that you are well. Let us pray together. Father, we come to you today during this time of great uncertainty, and we ask that you guide us through your Holy Spirit, through that advocate that Jesus gave to us so that we could be a more perfect and more honorable body of Christ that follows you. God, we lift up all of those today who are in leadership. We pray for the president, we pray for the governors, we pray for the mayors, for the city council members, and the county commissioners. All of those individuals who are making decisions today on our behalf and for our benefit and for our safety. God, I ask that you just blanket them with your spirit and give them the spirit of courage and wisdom so that they can make those choices and do the things that need to be done in order to get through this. God, I lift up all of the healthcare workers that are going to work each and every day to care for the sick. Your son is a healer and these people in what they do embody what you were when you walked this earth, a healer of the sick. God, I, wrap, I, I hope that the Spirit wraps them with protection and with courage and with power so that they can get through this time and help as many as possible. We lift up all of those first responders, wherever they may be in our country and in the world, that are going out each and every day and doing what they need to do in order to make our community safe. God, I lift up all of those who are essential personnel, who are going to work during this time when all of us are staying at home, going out into the world of uncertainty so that our communities and our lives can go on a little bit more normally than what they would have normally been. I pray protection over them. Always, God, we're praying protection over those in our armed services who are on bases here, who are on bases around the world, that are away from their community during this time of uncertainty. Pray protection over them and give them what they need in order to get through so that they can get home to their communities and to their families. And specifically, Lord, I lift up all of the prayer requests within this church. We still have them. We pray for Carol, who's recovering from surgery, for Mark, who is going through chemo at home, for uh, Red and for Patty, who are recovering. We pray for all people who are in this church right now that need our prayers. We do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to thank you uh, for tuning in again this morning. Um, uh, we are uh, continuing to pray for this church during this time. If uh, you have a prayer request, go ahead and send it in to us the way that you would normally do or get it to one of us so that we can get it on um, our prayer request board and uh, make sure that that is a part of uh, what we do on a weekly basis here um, during this time when we are not meeting uh, together physically. I want to lift up uh, Jeffrey uh, uh, this morning for uh, the last couple of weeks helping me out and helping this church out, stay connected through getting videos on, the, um, on Facebook and on the internet, and uh, he's doing this while he's also putting himself out there by going to work as well. So uh, let's uh, pray uh, an extra one for, for him. I, f I pray that you are finding um, uh, a new normal in your life uh, right now, in your home, in your work, and with uh, all the screens that we're now uh, uh, can interacting with that may we may have not been before. And um, I hope that uh, uh, it does not wear upon us and that we uh, stay connected in whatever way that we can. As this um, pandemic wears on, uh, it's only natural for us to question. 
as we start to hear the news and the statistics about what's going on around the world and in our country, it's only natural for us to question what's going on. Just as the message that we talked about last week with Martha and with Mary um, and their interaction with Jesus, uh, and they questioned the presence and where was God, where was Jesus in their time of need. I think it's okay for us to have those questions come up in us and be able to wrestle with them as Jacob wrestled with the angels. Because it is only when we wrestle with our questions about our faith and about what God is doing in our lives do we sometimes have a revelation that God pokes through our reality and gives us something that we need at that moment. And during this Lenten season, as we are asked to look at the world differently, as we are asked to look at the world in a way that maybe we hadn't in previous times, I hope that we are using this time to come up with different ways of answering those questions. Maybe through a spiritual practice, maybe through reading scripture, whatever that might be. Because here is the situation, is that we are in this pandemic. But what good comes out of that is up to us. There are some things that we do not have control over in our world right now and in our lives right now, but there are some things that we absolutely have control over. And how we spend our time, how we spend our days, how we respond to the crisis that's before us. We do have control over that. Just personally, I have started to use prayer as a way to remind me of washing my hands. They say that we're supposed to wash our hands for 20 seconds. Well, I have decided to go ahead and use the Lord's Prayer while I'm washing my hands. So each time I go to the sink or wherever I'm at, I am reciting the Lord's Prayer as I'm washing my hands back and front, fingers and everything in between. And I do it out loud to remind myself of what I'm doing. And I even do it when I'm in places where people are around me. To remind them that there is a way to go through this. There is a way to rely upon our faith. And I have to tell you, I might be uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer now up to 10 to 15 times a day. But it's something that we can do that we can take control of during this time of uncertainty. And I hope and I pray that you have uh, another practice or maybe even incorporate that practice into your daily life or into your kid's life or grandkid's life. Share that. But to be able to pray while we're washing our hands because it reminds us, it centers us of who we are and whose we are. So going on with our um, lesson and our understanding of conversations with Jesus uh, in Scripture and how that relates to us, we're coming to the end. And I want you to go ahead and, and uh, take out your Bibles and read Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 35. And then when you're done with that, go ahead and read uh, chapter uh, verses 20 through 25 again. Uh, just to kind of get an idea of um, uh, what we're going to be talking about. So go ahead and do that. Go ahead and press pause and then come back to us when you have uh, finished. It is Palm Sunday, the day uh, in the church that we normally talk about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We have the picture of Jesus coming in from the Mount of Olives, with the crowd following him and everybody is chanting and he's going into one gate and everybody is there, everybody is gathered. But what we don't know sometimes and don't realize that there were two processions that day. The one that Jesus was participating in 
that he deliberately went ahead and uh, used the symbolism of the Old Testament by riding in on a colt to represent that he is a king of peace. And there was also a procession coming into the back of Jerusalem during that time, and it would have normally happened, and it would have been Pilate with the Roman legions, and they would have been coming in in order to keep peace during this time of Passover. So we have a, 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 a dualistic way of, of looking at these two entries, one of peace and one of domination and oppression, one of, of life and of a new way of looking at the world, and one of... Uh, uh, of just being uh, subjected to a rule. Keep that in mind as we travel through this week. Jesus is an alternative way of looking at how we live our lives. But there's a lot going on in this verse and that we've read, these verses. We have Judas agrees to portray, uh, portray Jesus in 14 through 16, and in, it's interesting, not in this one, but in other, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, this is where Satan makes his uh, comeback uh, from uh, the previous chapters uh, when he was tempting Jesus. But this is where we see Satan coming back in and entering into Judas. We also have the Passover uh, with the disciples, uh, verses 17 through 25. We have the Lord's Supper, 26 through 30. And we have the Peter's denial and the denial and Jesus' denial of the, of the disciples, uh, 31 through 35. So there's a lot going on there. But I want us to focus on these conversations that Jesus is having with his disciples and with, with Peter specifically. Because this is a group that had been walking with him for the previous three years of his ministry. They had been with him, most of them, from the very beginning. They had given up their businesses, their lives, their families, everything they gave up to follow him during his public ministry. And here we have it at the very end, at the point where they think something is going to happen, something is going to change uh, in, in their ministry, that they're going back to Jerusalem in order to make a statement. And here, at this moment, Jesus is basically making accusations of betrayal. I call them the capital B for betrayal with Judith, which uh, inevitably ends with death. And then the small B betrayal that he talks about with Peter and with others. He tells um, Judas, truly I tell you, one of you that were here will betray me and hand me over. And with the others, you all become deserters of me this night. That's got to be a hard conversation to have, a hard one to be a part of. The conversations that we have talked about up to this point, we have Jesus talking to Satan. We have Jesus with Nicodemus, Jesus with the blind man, Jesus with the Samaritan women, woman, Jesus with Martha and Mary. And all of those conversations, there's nothing in the scripture that say that he was out of control, that he was angry, that he was frustrated. It was just that he was having very calm conversations. Even with Satan, it was a calm conversation. And here we have in the conversations today, Jesus is very straightforward and matter of fact with his disciples with Judas, and with Peter. We see that Jesus and God, by extension, that he understands our humanity to the core. Our fallenness at all levels. He sees us. This scripture and the way that he talks to his disciples tells me that God knows me personally, and he knows you personally. 
Jesus knows us and who we are. He understands that uh, during moments of struggle and of uncertainty, we may question what we believe. We may question what we understand. This is a hard message for us during this time because we wish and we know and we, did, we have the foresight of knowing the end of the story. The disciples did not. In these verses, we see that our human nature is to make an exchange of our faith, to make an exchange of who we are and what we do and how we live our lives for the covenant of Christ. We just saw, just previously, when we were reading these verses, that there was this new covenant that Jesus gave to his disciples. The moment where he basically erased everything that the Old Testament was talking about and said, yes, all of that is true, but it is now embodied in me, in a new covenant. And in response to that new covenant, there were already exchanges being made. How far can I push back against this new covenant? How far can I go to retain the life that I want, that I feel comfortable, and still have this covenant? It's important that we know that at least in uh, Judas's um, betrayal, there is a monetary exchange. That's a real clear statement about how we live our lives and what it means to be a follower of Christ and what it means to be a disciple is that our priority is not going to be upon material things. It's not going to be upon the things of this world. And that ties directly in to what Jesus has been saying in all these other conversations. Jesus is always focusing on the heavenly. And everybody else is always talking about the earthly, about the material, about the here, about the now. And he's saying, no, it's about the future. It's about a new kingdom. It's about a new way of looking at the world. It's about a new way of participating with God in that world. That material exchange of silver really anchors that message. Sometimes when we have our conversations with parents that are truth-telling conversations, it's not easy to hear the truth. I can remember numerous conversations with both my mother and my father where I did not want to hear the truth, but I sat and I listened. I remember having conversations with my two boys where I was telling them what the truth of the situation was and they did not want to hear it. And they found ways or tried to have ways in order to get out of it or to explain it or to say, that's not going to be me. I'm not going to be the one doing that. Our conversations with Jesus are the same way. I see that a lot going on, and Jill has told me that she has seen that when she has been in the hospital rooms with people that are close to death. They start to bargain with God and say, if only I, uh, you get me out of this, I will go ahead and do this. We have to have real conversations with ourselves and with God through Jesus, in order to understand who we are as a body of Christ. And I know this message is not uplifting during this time that we're in, but we are in Holy Week right now. We are just starting it. And the part of Holy Week that we cannot ignore is the darkness, the shadow that we have to walk through. To get to Easter, we still have to go through Friday. 
To get to the resurrection, we still have to have the crucifixion. To get through enlightenment and a new way of living, we may have to go through a pandemic as a society. There will be darkness ahead. There will be hard conversations that we will have with others and with ourselves. But in those conversations, I hope and I pray that we find and understand what the true meaning of Easter is. That we can faithfully walk this week and through this pandemic as a community and as followers of Christ to get to that Easter morning, to that resurrection. Because that truly is not just a new way of looking at the world. That is a new way of being in the world. We are all a part of the resurrection. Let us pray that we get to that point in our lives this week. Let us pray that we are able to have and hear those hard conversations. And yes, the truth hurts sometimes. And God is asking us to see the truth of humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we have the strength and the courage to understand what that looks like through scripture, through community, through prayer, so that we can come to understand what it truly means to be an Easter people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we ask that you give us the strength in order to be a part of the body of Christ in this world today. Especially today because it's hard to be a part of a body that is physically separated. It is hard to know what other people need in their lives when we are not able to see the expressions on their face. Give us the courage to reach out to a neighbor, to a friend, to a co-worker, whatever it might be, and offer them the peace that we have in our hearts because we are followers of Christ. And because we are, we know the end of the story. And we know that during this time of the year, especially when we celebrate Easter, we know there is a different ending. We know that death is not the final ending of the story. There is something more. Let us have this peace during this Holy Week. In Jesus' name.